York, April 1912. We're aboard the 9th Avenue Elevated Line, sitting next to Guglielmo Marconi. He's just come to Manhattan via the RMS Lusitania. He's here to pitch potential investors on an idea to expand the American Marconi's wireless base in the U.S. So far, he had overseen construction of stations in Egypt and in Arabia at the mouth of the Red Sea, with plans to add stations in India, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, and Africa's west coast. These stations were tied into the British government and Marconi's British wing of his wireless telegraphy company. By adding stations in the United States on the east and west coasts, as well as in the Caribbean and Hawaii, the hope was that his American investors would be linked with the entire network of communication and of profits. That presentation to investors was scheduled for tomorrow, but this evening, a knock on Marconi's hotel room door from a New York Times reporter had interrupted his dinner and changed his plans. As their train reached 14th Street, the slaughterhouse district's air was thick and pungent. Marconi had booked passage aboard the Titanic for its maiden voyage, but a change in plans forced him to cancel. He later wrote to his wife, I have seen the most harrowing scenes of frantic people coming here to me and to the offices of the company to implore and beg us to find out if there might not be some hope for their relations. Very little could be done. The two men got out and finished their evening journey on foot, walking west towards the Hudson River. Soon, Marconi began to see groups of distraught men and women. As they approached Pier 54, two men walked past a young lady sitting on the lap of an older woman, both of them crying as the older woman kissed the younger's forehead and stroked her hair. The Times reporter noted that Marconi himself had begun to tear up. aboard the RMS Carpathia and headed for the upper deck towards the Marconi wireless room. Inside, illuminated by the glow of a single light, was one of Marconi's employees, the RMS Titanic's junior wireless operator, Harold Bride. He sat with heavily bandaged feet, tapping away on his telegraph key. Bride recognized the boss he had yet to meet and stopped working. The two men shook hands. Bride, at the time only 22, began to tell Marconi the story of the tragedy that would forever alter the course of Guglielmo Marconi's career. Welcome to Breaking Walls, episode number 76. My name is James Scully. Tonight on Breaking Walls, we pick up our story on the history of the American radio drama after the sinking of the Titanic. As you heard on the prologue, Marconi Wireless was installed aboard the Titanic. The problem was competing companies wouldn't accept each other's signals and not all ships were equipped with wireless. Although Marconi Wireless was responsible for saving the lives of over 700 people, 1,500 perished. Tonight will tell the story of what happened next. If this is your first time listening to Breaking Walls, thank you very much. You're hearing Metamorphosis Number 2, arranged by David DePeters for vibraphone and harp, and played by Miss Elizabeth Hainan. This composition is featured on her latest album, Home, works for solo harp. It's available on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, and Pandora. You can find out more information about Miss Hainan at elizabethhainan.com. And you can find this show on iTunes and everywhere you get your podcasts. If you know of any places you've looked for breaking walls and couldn't find it, shoot me an email. I'm at james at thewallbreakers.com. I'll make sure the show goes up. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash thewallbreakers, and there you can unlock juicy bonus content and other extras. If you're listening on your iPhone, on iTunes, give us a quick rating and review. It helps the algorithm and helps more people discover the show. And to keep easily abreast with the show, 
you can join our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. In this way, I desire to greet the boys progressively at their meeting at the Hotel Manhattan. I feel that the progressive party should appeal peculiarly to the young men and therefore to the boys who are to be the next generation of voters. was the sound of Theodore Roosevelt speaking via a cylinder recording to members of the Boy Scouts in 1913. Back in 1904, Hugo Gernsback, a Luxembourg American inventor, created the first dry cell battery and went to market with it. He was just 20 years old at the time. By the end of the year, he had co-founded the nation's first radio parts center, Electro Importing, here on Fulton Street in Manhattan. The following year, he sold 125,000 copies of a mail order parts catalog. In 1908, he started the first radio periodical, Modern Electrics, and designed a 10-cent crystal set. Gernsback began receiving over 1,000 orders per day, and in 1910, he founded the Wireless Association of America, which soon had over 10,000 members. By that year, American radio amateurs surpassed both the U.S. Navy and United Wireless in numbers and often in quality of apparatus. It gave amateur operators the lead in the race to control the airwaves. While Europe had begun to put wireless regulations in place by 1903, it wasn't until June 24, 1910, that Congress passed the first U.S. radio law, the Wireless Ship Act. It mandated universal compatibility of all maritime equipment, which had to be capable of transmitting and receiving messages for over 100 miles. All commercial operators now also had to have a license. It went into effect in July of 1911. Ship owners had one year to equip themselves. But just nine months later, the Titanic sunk. Until about 1911, the term radio existed only as a prefix, as in radio telegraphy or radio telephony. But in the US, the early part of the 1910s was a time of both progressive technology and reform government. Before the Titanic disaster, there were three issues that plagued wireless telegraphy. One, poor reception, which was still partly an issue due to two, interference, both purposeful, like AT&T's sabotage of the America's Cup races in 1901, as well as accidental interference from various wireless operators conversing or trying to connect over the air. The third was scam business objectives, like those of Lee DeForest's former partner, Abraham White, who suckered hundreds of investors out of money for wireless stations he never intended to transmit from. Wireless had fortunately lacked a watershed moment like Upton Sinclair's The Jungle created for the meat industry and Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lives created for the New York education and housing reform movement. The Titanic disaster, for better or worse, provided that embarrassment. Just four days after the sinking, the U.S. Senate began an inquiry hearing chaired by Senator William Alden Smith at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. The inquiry was a subcommittee of the Senate's Commerce Committee. We're here on day 10 of the inquiry on April 28th. Senator Smith is questioning the Titanic's Marconi Jr. wireless operator, Harold Bride. Bride's feet are still heavily bandaged from frostbite received the night of the disaster. He's been wheeled up in a gurney. Mr. Bride. You spoke the other day of your mate Phillips, who is the chief operator, I believe, and yourself putting on life preservers, as I recollect, about 10 minutes before the boat sank. Yes, I think it would be somewhere about that time before the boat sank, but I could not say for certain. And you did not leave the ship until the captain gave you permission? No. Had everyone else gone? No, sir. There were several people about it. Passengers? I could not say. I should think they would be passengers or crew. There were quite a number of sailors 
who assisted in getting the collapsible off the top deck. Did any of them get into it? No, sir. I think I was the only one who was in it. When you did get in, was it before it left the side of the Titanic? I was not exactly in it either. I got hold of it. That was as far as I got. You got hold of it? Yes. And as it fell into the water, it fell over, upside down, is that correct? Yes, sir. So that you were down under this overturned boat? Yes, sir. You swam out from under the boat, and that was the last time you saw the boat sink? Which boat? The Titanic. A short time after that, I saw the Titanic sink. How many minutes afterwards? The time was long enough to give me a chance of getting away from the Titanic itself. From the side? Yes, the distance I estimate at 150 feet. During 18 days of official investigations, testimony was recorded from over 80 witnesses. These included surviving passengers and crew members, as well as captains and crew members of other ships in the vicinity, expert witnesses, various officials, and others involved in receiving and transmitting the news of the disaster. Subjects covered included the ice warnings received, the inadequate but somehow legal number of lifeboats, the handling of the ship and its speed, the Titanic's distress calls, and the handling of the evacuation of the ship. The major issues immediately uncovered were a lack of emergency preparations for passengers, a lack of warnings for the crew and passengers after the iceberg was struck, an inadequate number of boats that weren't previously tested, and third-class passengers were ill-informed of the seriousness of the situation. One major finding was that the SS California had been much nearer to the disaster, 20 miles, than its captain was willing to admit the night of the disaster. The committee recommended the British government take drastic action against that captain. The British media, however, saw the inquiry as a thinly veiled attempt to attack the British shipping industry and an affront to British honor, two accusations that would resurface during World War I. The U.S. government saw the disaster as an opportunity to take control of the Wild West atmosphere of the wireless airwaves, passing the Radio Act of 1912. It went into effect on December 13th of that year. The act outlined key points that would alter the wireless landscape. All operators must now be licensed, including ham operators. Amateur ham operators are only permitted to transmit via shortwave signals of 200 meters or less. All distress calls have to take priority over anything else. These calls will be issued at 300 meter waves and all shore stations need to continuously monitor for these potential calls. The official distress call is now SOS. There will be fines of $500 for malicious interference and $2,500 for sending false distress calls. The Navy is to be given control of all wavelengths between 600 and 1600 meters. Naval stations are now required to transmit commercial messages if no commercial station is within 100 miles. And finally, the Secretary of Commerce is to be given power to issue licenses and make other regulations. This 1912 Act also provided that broadcasting licenses would only be issued to citizens of the United States and, in times of war or disaster, the President could close or take over all private wireless stations. The amateurs were positioned as culprits who needed to be stopped. Guglielmo Marconi was hailed as the man responsible for helping to save lives during the Titanic's disaster. Marconi supported regulation. By doing so, his American Marconi company would put an end to amateur interference and further strengthen their monopoly. 
Some dismantled their apparatuses. Several amateurs applied for licenses, passed the exam, and went to work for corporate entities or the government. Others continued operating as before. One amateur from Pittsburgh recalled that nobody in radio knew anything about licensing. We knew that commercial stations, by which I mean ship and government stations, had call signs, but I think there were very few people who had even heard of the license regulations, let alone read them, and no one thought the regulations applied to him, the individual. It certainly didn't apply to the listener. Three years before the Titanic sank in April of 1909, an electronics instructor in San Jose, California named Charles Herald constructed a broadcasting station. That year, he started a Herald College of Engineering and Wireless. He began to advertise his broadcasting station in San Jose via Hugo Gernsback's Modern Electrics magazine. By 1912, he had licensed an experimental station, tapped a trolley wire for DC current, spread two miles of an antenna across downtown roofs, and began broadcasting weekly for a half hour. Later, his wife Sybil presided over a Wednesday evening program called Little Hams, in which she played popular records. Well, at that time, it was wireless. We never heard the radio. It was, our, it was the wireless telephone, as they called it in those days. First, I remember, it was just the voice. What we was trying to do was to re improve the reception of the voice and the different uh, adjustments that would be made on the instruments that uh, Mr. Harold had there. And finally, as it was improved and grew better each time that we worked on it, then finally we started broadcasting the music. And I really believe that I was the first woman to ever broadcast a program. On September the 5th, 1914, our first baby boy was born. Uh, and we have a picture of him where I'm holding up to him up to the transmitter, and he was just crying as hard as he could cry. But that was the thing we wanted, to see if that baby's cry could be transmitted to the Fairmont Hotel. It was exactly this kind of ingenious entrepreneurial inventor that the major wireless entities in the U.S. were trying to extinguish. Herald Station is unofficially considered the first station with regular broadcasting. It would go on to become KCBS San Francisco. My brother, it gives me pleasure as President of the United States to send this greeting to you. There are some dark pages in the history of the white man's dealings with the Indians. The great white father now calls you his brother, not his children. Because you have shown in your education and in your settled ways of life aren't manly, worthy qualities of sound character. That was a recording of 28th U.S. President Herbert Hoover in 1915. Between 1914 and 15, the United States of America's population, for the first time, exceeded 100 million. The U.S. government carried on diplomatic relations with both Great Britain and Germany at the onset of World War I, while AT&T got into the wireless industry. Under head of research J.J. Carty, the decision was made by AT&T not to let wireless become a competitor. He said that whoever can control and supply the necessary telephone repeater will exert a dominating influence on the art of wireless telephony. In 1909, Cardi had announced to the press that AT&T would have a transcontinental telephone line open in time for the Panama Pacific Exposition, also known as the San Francisco World's Fair of 1915. By 1912, little progress had been made. It was suggested to Cardi that DeForest Audion be used. AT&T scientist Harold Arnold improved DeForest Audion by removing all gas from the tube, creating the first vacuum tube in the process. AT&T was able to acquire the patent rights of DeForest's for a mere $50,000 because DeForest was once again in legal trouble. 
1913, DeForest was on trial with his radio telephone company associates James Dunlop Smith and Elmer Burlingame for two counts of mail fraud and four counts of conspiracy to defraud. The trial began in New York in November of 1913. The reform government policies allowed U.S. District Attorney Robert Stevenson to pursue the case with fervor, and much of the testimony he got was quite damning. The company had raised more than $1.5 million, but only $345,000 of that made it into the company's treasuries. Stevenson portrayed all three defendants as being equally guilty even though DeForest's assistant Frank Butler testified to the inventor's ignorance of the scheme. At some point during closing, Stevenson held up one of DeForest's audion tubes and charged that, with this worthless piece of glass, DeForest had the audacity to claim it would soon be possible to send the human voice across the Atlantic. Stevenson urged for a guilty verdict. The case went to the jury after 12 p.m. on December 31, 1913. While the rest of New York celebrated the new year, DeForest waited for word. Shortly after midnight, the courtroom attendant told DeForest the jury had returned. Upon hearing this, he collapsed. At 1 a.m. on New Year's Day, 1914, the jury filed in. James Dunlop Smith and Elmer Burlingame were found guilty on two counts of mail fraud. DeForest was found not guilty on those two counts and on the first three counts of conspiracy to defraud. On the fourth count, the jury disagreed, and Lee DeForest was once again a free man. New Jersey, 1914. You're hearing the sound of David Sarnoff driving his automobile towards the New Jersey coast. Sitting beside him is his former rival and now colleague, Roy Wiegan. Near the town of Belmar, where the Shark River pushes inland, he finally spies what he had been looking for, the top of a 400-foot-tall silver tower peeking into view above the tree line. Soon, a row of towers running more than a mile came into view, holding aloft a long, thin wire. It was at that time the largest radio antenna ever built. David Sarnoff couldn't wait to find out what he'd be able to hear once he hooked the antenna up to the invention of a young gifted student from Columbia University named Edward Howard Armstrong. Sarnoff saw his position as chief inspector for Marconi Wireless as a chance to see how all the wireless gear actually worked in the real world. Marconi Wireless still struggled with reliable transatlantic service. If Sarnoff was correct in his assumption, Armstrong held the key to rescuing the company. Both believed practical experiments were the most likely way to reveal new discoveries. On this day, they formed an instantaneous friendship. The new generation of transmitters used a high-speed electric motor to generate a continuous electromagnetic wave with a single fixed length. By focusing power into a single wavelength, the generators could send messages much further. In addition to carrying Morse code, these waves now could be modified to easily carry the human voice. This also paved the way for the entire broadcast dial, as thousands of different operators could now tune into different specific wavelengths, dramatically increasing the airwaves' power to connect different places from around the world. The station at Belmar was designed to solve every problem that had dogged the 12-year effort to send transatlantic messages. The Marconi Company's messages would no longer need to be relayed from Newfoundland to New York over telegraph cables owned by Marconi competitors. Marconi promised that his transmitters would be able to blast out waves so strong that a British stock trader's order could be wirelessly transmitted to Belmar at the speed of light and then forwarded to Wall Street by a Marconi operator over a special Marconi-owned wired cable. Howard Armstrong claimed his invention was able to grab hold of an invisible airwave and greatly strengthen its amplitude. 
at 4 p.m. David Sarnoff, Roy Wiegand, Edward Howard Armstrong, and Armstrong's Columbia professor John Moorcraft went to an unheated shack where the antenna wires for the Belmar station terminated. Using the station's standard equipment, which wasn't connected to Armstrong's invention, Sarnoff put on a pair of headphones and tuned into the company station at Glace Bay, Canada. The reception came in clearly. Next, they attached Armstrong's device, hooking it up to the giant Marconi antenna. Suddenly, the incoming signals became not merely audible, but deafening. Sarnoff backed away and noticed that even at 50 feet away from the headphones, he could hear the messages coming through. Next, Sarnoff tuned into Clifton Bay, Ireland. To his astonishment, the signal was so powerful that they could hear it right through the headphones. Then, he tuned into the Poulsen Wireless Telephone and Telegraph Company's San Francisco transmission with such clarity that Sarnoff was able to easily jot down the 40 words per minute the station was transmitting to its sister station in Portland, Oregon. Sarnoff then overheard the Poulsen station in Hawaii. He began to transcribe the conversation that the operator was attempting to have with San Francisco. It said, lightning bad, shall ground aerial wires. And the response was, okay, we'll call you in 15 minutes. The men in Belmar, New Jersey, were having an easier time picking up the messages from Hawaii than their competitor's San Francisco station. Finally, at 1.25 in the morning, Sarnoff tuned into the Telefunken station in Germany near Berlin with such clarity that at 5 a.m. the four men headed back to New York together with the knowledge that Howard Armstrong had invented something that had changed the wireless telegraphic landscape forever. He had created regeneration. When Sarnoff returned to New York, he wrote a four-page memo to his bosses describing the successes of the test and musing about how the Marconi company could profit as a result. He said, unless there be other systems of equal merits which are unknown to me, I am of the opinion that this is the most remarkable receiving station in existence. Unfortunately, on June 28, 1914, Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand visited the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo, where he and his wife Sophie were assassinated by members of the Serbian Black Hand, plunging Europe into the Great War. Howard Armstrong had drawings of his regeneration invention notarized on January 13, 1913. In October of 1913, when he could afford to, Armstrong applied for a patent. Lee DeForest discovered Howard Armstrong's work shortly after his trial ended. DeForest, attempting to beat Armstrong to the punch, applied for a patent for an audion oscillator on March 20, 1914, and on a feedback circuit on September 23, 1915. DeForest claimed that he had made the same discovery as Armstrong back in 1912 while he was working for the Federal Telegraph. He did jot the observation down in his notebook on August 6th of that year. No radio patents have generated more controversy. The resulting litigation and bad blood between these two men lasted an entire lifetime and legally in court until 1934. The case went to the Supreme Court twice and reportedly cost more than $1.5 million in lawyers' fees. The crux of Armstrong's case was that even if DeForest did jot down a note about feedback and regeneration in 1912, he couldn't explain why the phenomena happened. Armstrong understood the physics and engineering as his notarized drawing proved. In 1914, with his position on more solid ground, DeForest was again approached by AT&T about the rights to acquire the Audion. DeForest sold them a non-exclusive license for $90,000. But after the 1915 Panama Pacific World's Fair, when AT&T made no mention of any of DeForest's work in their exhibit, he vowed to retaliate for the slight. In October of 1915, DeForest learned that AT&T intended to commence wireless transmission of voices between the Eiffel Tower and the U.S. Naval Station at Arlington. For years, he had been trying to fulfill his dream of transatlantic radio telephony. Now, someone other than he would attain it. At this point in time, there were now three main wireless telegraph and telephone companies, American Marconi, 
AT&T, and a third company which had previously been in the electricity and lamp business, General Electric. AT&T wanted exclusive rights to DeForest Audion and all vacuum tube inventions he might make over the next seven years. They also wanted him out of the wireless telephony business. For $250,000 and the right to continue manufacturing equipment for amateurs to use for distribution of music and news, DeForest agreed. And in the spring of 1917, he signed away his patents and his career as a major wireless inventor. Are you new to old-time radio? A hardcore fan? Curious, but don't know where to start? Try the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to the great horror, crime, and suspense shows from the golden age of radio, including tales from Suspense, Lights Out, Quiet Please, The Shadow, and more. Each episode features a classic or maybe not so classic story from the Old Time Radio Vault, complete with historical notes and trivia. At the end of each podcast, your mysterious old hosts, Tim, Joshua, and Eric, discuss the merits of the story and decide whether or not it stands the test of time, balancing insight and humor to make you think harder about what made these old shows so great, even when they aren't so great. The Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society is available everywhere you get your podcasts, as long as you get your podcast from iTunes or Podbean. For more information about the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, or to download episodes directly, visit ghoulishdelights.com. And now back to Breaking Walls. In August of 1914, the U.S. government's main concern regarding wireless were the British and German long-distance stations along the eastern U.S. seaboard. On the ground in Europe, Britain had cut Germany's telegraph cables, so wireless was all the more important. The Marconi Company was technically a British company. It had stations in Maine, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. The Germans had two transatlantic stations in the U.S., one on Long Island, belonging to the Atlantic Communications Company. They were a subsidiary of Telefunken, based in Brandenburg, Germany. And a second station in New Jersey was built by the German firm HOMAG to communicate with Hanover. President Wilson was hopeful, even sending a wireless message to Kaiser Wilhelm from the station in January of 1914. However, as early as August 6, 1914, the New York Times printed allegations of breaches in neutrality. An amateur operator had been monitoring Telefunken's transmissions from Long Island and turned his findings over to the government. Military orders in cipher originating in Berlin were allegedly received in Long Island and dispatched to German cruisers in the Atlantic. The U.S. government, wanting to remain neutral, placed censors at each German and British-owned station so that all incoming and outgoing transmissions would be screened. The Marconi Company claimed the Navy had no legal right to censor. The only government authority with any authority over wireless was Department of Commerce, who had no authority to restrict the content or the destination of the messages anyway. John Briggs, president of American Marconi, pleaded, saying the Marconi Company of America is an American company, not a foreign one, and thus should not be under any surveillance. The Marconi Company filed a formal complaint with the government protesting the censorship. The U.S. government countered with allegations that the Marconi Company had violated neutrality in September of 1914. Woodrow Wilson, the president, said that the Attorney General Thomas W. Gregory had given him full authority to close any station that did not comply with the censorship code. On September 24th, Marconi's most important Atlantic station in Long Island was closed, and two weeks later their suit was thrown out of court. On April 23, 1915, the New York Times reported that the big telefunk and wireless station at Long Island, the plant through which the German government transmits most of its official communications to the United States, and through which the German embassy communicates with Berlin, has been quietly, almost overnight so to speak, increased from a 35 kilowatt plant into one of 100 kilowatts. Officials of the Atlantic Communication Company, the corporation that controls Telefunken Station in Long Island, 
refused yesterday to discuss the work now being hurried to completion. In Europe, civilian casualties were becoming a regular occurrence in both warring and neutral countries. On May 7, 1915, the RMS Lusitania was torpedoed and sunk without warning by a German U-boat. 1,198 people died, including more than 100 children under the age of two and 124 Americans. The Germans made no effort to rescue survivors. Most Americans, however, still wanted to avoid the war. Then, on June 30, 1915, huge headlines announced 20 or more Americans lost when Germans sink the Armenian. It was now suspected by the government that seemingly innocent messages sent in either English or German could be cipher code with war plans and correspondence. U.S. Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels said, It is becoming increasingly evident that no censorship of radio stations can be absolutely effective outside of complete government operation and control. The government must obtain control of all coast radio stations and operate them in conjunction with naval stations for commercial work in times of peace. On October 9, 1916, a German U-boat torpedoed six ships off the coast of New England. The New York Herald, as part of its news bulletin service, sent out a wireless message warning all boats in the vicinity that a German submarine was there. The Navy actually maintained that sending such a message was unneutral because a British ship could have intercepted the message and sunk the submarine. The Navy then took control of the Herald Station. Navy officers visited other Atlantic Coast stations to remind the operators to remain neutral. The Herald was damned if they did and damned if they didn't and could not remain neutral. And the Navy used the convenience to act. In January of 1917, British intelligence intercepted a telegram sent from the German Foreign Office that proposed a military alliance between Germany and Mexico in the event of the United States entering World War I against Germany. When the United States was defeated, Mexico would recover Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. This has come to be called the Zimmerman Telegram, after German Foreign Secretary Arthur Zimmerman publicly admitted the telegram was genuine on March 3rd. On April 6, 1917, Congress voted to declare war on Germany. Today, the magic key will turn to the incomparable George M. Cohan. This Tex O'Rourke, folks, unannounced because I've just been asked to perform a mighty pleasant task. To introduce to you a chap who's just as well known and loved down in the cactus country as he is right here in the gay white way that he helped to make famous. He's the fellow who immortalized Yankee Doodle, synchronized the land of the free and the home of the brave and set old glory waving to 4-4 time. Author, composer, playwright, star of the screen stage and radio, artist and musician, well, you put them all together, add a dance, a dash of dancing feet, strike up the band, set off the fireworks, give three cheers, and you just about got a picture of Uncle Sam's favorite nephew, one of the grandest troopers in the world, George M. Cohan. that very elaborate introduction, I'm afraid I've lost my voice entirely. <laughs> However, it's very nice to be here. I consider it a great privilege to be on this program for the American Legion. I've been asked to sing a verse and chorus of a little marching song of mine the boys adopted more or less during the war. I don't have to tell you I'm not much of a vocalist, but I'll do the best I can with it. So we'll just imagine for the moment we're back 
1917 and the orders from the front. Forward march, Doctor. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling, you and me, every son of liberty. Hurry right away, don't World War I brought with it great advances in technology for air, sea, and land combat. Edward Howard Armstrong served as captain in the U.S. Army Signal Corps. During this period, Armstrong's most significant accomplishment was the development of a supersonic heterodyne receiving circuit. This new superheterodyne circuit made radio receivers more sensitive and selective. The key feature of the superheterodyne approach is the mixing of incoming radio signals with a locally generated different frequency signal built within the radio set. This circuit is typically referred to as a mixer. The end result is a fixed unchanging frequency which is more easily amplified and detected by a subsequent circuit stage that follows the mixer. Howard Armstrong received a patent for his design in 1920. The circuit he invented is still used today. Meanwhile, the Navy requisitioned Marconi's, other companies, and other countries' transoceanic stations in the U.S. They also created the world's most powerful transmitter at New Brunswick, New Jersey, and created a patents pool that allowed major American firms, General Electric and AT&T, to freely use any wireless patents for the duration of the war so long as it helped the war effort. This created a giant leap forward in the technology and standardization associated with wireless telegraphy. The war expanded production capability as well. GE alone supplied 200,000 radio tubes to the military. A field previously dominated by lone inventors was now dominated by corporations. As the war drew to a close, amateur and corporate wireless operators alike were eager to get back to transmitting. On September 26, 1919, the wireless ban was finally lifted. It created a surge for new licenses and new receiving stations. One man was once again ready for the demand. David Sarnoff. Uh, but experiment is now being attempted with wireless telephony from a ship 1,000 miles at sea to Marconi House. Is that so? Hello? Hello? What's that? Step on the cat, you stop me, you pencil. What's that noise? Yes, yes, President Lincoln speaking. You're a liar. President Lincoln is dead. S.S. Yes, Lincoln. S.S. Yes, Lincoln. S.S. Yes, yes, Lincoln. What's the name, Mr. Lincoln? Your yes. first name. He's at London. Cone. Cone. Yes, I'm Cone. Cone. Sam Cone. Say, to whom are you speaking from? To whom? In 1919, GE's vice president, Owen D. Young, one government approval for a new strategy meant to end wireless patent wars and foreign influence on the industry with a chosen instrument to control the patents the Navy was releasing. This legislative distrust of foreigners was aimed directly at British Marconi and Guglielmo himself. No longer would heroes born in countries outside the U.S. be celebrated within the U.S. British Marconi, sensing its weak position, traded its American facilities, employees, and licenses for a minority interest in the new American company, the Radio Corporation of America, or RCA, which would be owned by General Electric. RCA's incorporation papers required that all its officers needed to be U.S. citizens, with a majority of its stock held by Americans. RCA's intent was to sell an international radio telegraphy service, to license patents to equipment makers, to sell products others manufactured, and to manage patent royalties. In February of 1920, the government transferred the confiscated Marconi stations to RCA. The next day, RCA began International Radio Telegraphy Service. RCA's number three executive was the 29-year-old former assistant to Guglielmo Marconi and the man who helped broker the deal to create RCA, David Sarnoff. When Owen Young asked Sarnoff to analyze RCA's status and future, Sarnoff produced a 28-page memo which included a plan for the sale of radio music boxes for entertainment purposes. 
Sarnoff's plan had forecast a number of radios that could be bought and sold, and the profits that could be earned by selling each set for just $75. He presented the plan to GE's vice president, Owen Young, who also happened to be chairman of RCA's board. Sarnoff estimated that 100,000 sets could be sold. When GE president G.W. Rice caught wind of the idea, he endorsed a $2,500 RCA board approval for a radio music box prototype. In July, Owen Young traded 10% of RCA to AT&T in return for the rights to use all of their wireless patents. As part of the deal, GE and a subsidiary of AT&T, Westinghouse, would manufacture radio parts and receivers, and RCA would handle the sales distribution. The sale of transmitters would be up to AT&T. RCA was in charge of international communications and given limited rights to wireless broadcasting telephony. AT&T was in charge of all wired telephonic and wireless point-to-point -point telephonic communication. Along the way to production, RCA and Westinghouse had to confront the issue that all corporations interested in radio manufacturing and sale needed to. To get people to buy radio music boxes, they had to give them something to listen to. Our uh, first broadcasts really were not from a studio. They were from a tiny shack located on the roof of a six-story manufacturing building. We had a small room for the uh, transmitting apparatus and a still smaller room for the uh, phonograph equipment. We used this uh, arrangement through the winter. In the spring, we uh, moved to an auditorium in the manufacturing plant but the acoustics there were not very good, so we went back to the roof and erected a tent, and we broadcast from the tent. One night, uh, a storm came up and blew the tent off the roof. Uh, there went our uh, first radio studio. Following this, we broadcast temporarily in the open air from the roof of the building, and uh, that reminds me of another incident. In the spring and early summer, the moths and the bugs would fly around the electric lamps that we used to light the roof. And one night we had a tenor soloist on the program and while he was singing he started to hit a high note and he sucked a bug into his mouth and <laughs> he choked right in the middle of his song. <laughs> About the uh, same time we had a soprano soloist from Pittsburgh uh, who came out to East Pittsburgh. This uh, manufacturing building from which our open air broadcasts were being made uh, was located right next to the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad. This soprano soloist came out all dressed up in evening clothes. She looked beautiful. But right in the middle of her song, a Pennsylvania train went by and blew a great cloud of smoke and soot all over her hair, her face, and her dress. She just kept on singing through the smoke and soot and finally finished her song. Many amateur operators served as radio operators during World War I. It gave them the opportunity to learn on the latest tubed equipment. Equipment that wasn't yet available to the general public in 1920. Radio operators who were hired by corporations after the war had access to the latest transmitting tubes. Many began to broadcast from their own facilities. One such man was Frank Conrad of Pittsburgh. Yeah, that was a hobby I carried out at home. And thanks is one of those things where you uh, finally got deeper and deeper into it. I got to, uh, people would call me up at night and ask me to transmit. They want some, uh, said they had some friends who wanted to listen to something coming out of the air. So I would transmit either talk or phonograph music or something like that. And they finally got to uh, take care of that. I sort of arranged to send a program twice a week, every Wednesday and Saturday night. And that really started, uh, was, I'd say, it was the first regular broadcasting. Yeah, of course, at that time, I actually had no idea what it was going to end up into. Maybe if I had no idea what they end up into, I'd stop. <laughs> KDKA went on the air November 2nd, 1920, with a broadcast of that night's presidential election returns. The real start of KDKA was due to the fact that some of the department stores in Pittsburgh began to advertise radio sets, which would receive signals that came from my laboratory. Well, the summer company official, including Mr. H.P. Davis, he saw those. He thought, well, I hear that. That looks like that's going to be a big commercial uh, 
And uh, so he said, now we better do this out here in a good scale. This little one horse thing you've got down to your house isn't enough. So uh, we had a station there, licensed KDK, that was put up for the, for the purpose of transmitting from uh, East Pittsburgh to some of our other factories. Successfully did that, so we converted that to a broadcasting station. This is KDKA of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We shall now broadcast the election returns. <coughs> We are receiving these returns through the cooperation and by special arrangements with the Pittsburgh Post and Sun. We'd appreciate it if anyone hearing this broadcast would communicate with us, as we are very anxious to know how far the broadcast is reaching and how it is being received. While we're waiting for the returns to come in over the telephone, direct from the Post and Sun, I'll give you the list of offices in today's presidential election. Here they are. Some 30 million Americans are electing a president of the United States, a vice president, 34 United States senators, 435 members of the House of Representatives, governors of 34 states, and thousands of minor offices, county judges, and officials. <coughs> okay, those are the offices to be filled. And here are the seven complete presidential tickets that are being voted on. Republican, Warren G. Harding, Calvin Coolidge, Democratic, James M. Cox, and Franklin D. Roosevelt. The 1920s were a decade of consumption, speculation, extravagance, and expansion. In 1920 alone, Charlie Chaplin's The Kid was released in Hollywood. F. Scott Fitzgerald's This Side of Paradise and Sinclair Lewis's Main Street were both bestsellers. Air Mail was flown coast to coast for the first time. Man of War was the horse of the year. Babe Ruth smacked a major league record 59 home runs for his new team, the New York Yankees. And women, long overdue, won the right to vote. Though there's an image of a radio enthusiast working diligently in the middle of the night, manipulating antennas by him or herself, the truth is, radio was a social medium, and people who enjoyed radio enjoyed the company of those who shared in the excitement. Tens of thousands of Americans began building makeshift home receivers and exchanging sounds with other enthusiasts. By July of 1920, there were 15 times as many amateur stations in the U.S. as there were stations of any other kind. The Department of Commerce counted over 6,100 licenses in 1920. In 1921, that number jumped to over 10,800. To help bring order to the growing radio landscape, President Warren G. Harding appointed Herbert Hoover as the third Secretary of Commerce on March 5, 1921. The radio telephone had progressed from a hobby to a staple luxury. It brought the sounds of urban life to rural areas. Farmers became a desirable audience, and the government was eager to communicate information with them. The Navy's radio transmitters sent out daily agricultural reports throughout the U.S., an innovation referred to by the Department of Agriculture as the most important step of any kind in the wireless world. Radio boomed. Gimbel's Department Store, Ford Motor Company, the Omaha Grain Exchange, United Fruit, Packard Automobiles, and the St. Matthew's Cathedral in Laramie, Wyoming, all joined RCA, Westinghouse, and AT&T in the wireless industry. In 1922, the American public would invest more than $60 million in the purchase of home receiving sets. By mid-year, there were over 1 million receiving sets in American homes. Between April and May of 1922 alone, 100 new stations took to the air. On June 7, 1922, the Washington Post wrote, it's pretty hard to determine what is a radio store nowadays. In the larger cities, besides any number of shops that specialize in this equipment, nearly all electrical and hardware shops have added wireless sets as part of their stock. Now, drugstores have gone in for carrying all sorts of sets as well, from $10 and up. At this time, station program schedules were still non-existent. Programming was a hodgepodge of anything and everything that could be fed into a microphone so the station would remain online. 
Brooklyn-born band leader Vincent Lopez remembered his first night on the air, November 21st, 1921. We had to go up a rickety stairs to the studio, which was a, an old coat room, they tell me. And they had velour, red velour, and to batch the carpet, an upright piano that's seen the war, and a little, few stands around, everything in a circle. We didn't know what it was all about. There was a microphone right in the center. So Tommy says, uh, tune up. So he tuned up. What are you going to play? I said, I don't know. We didn't make up any program. You said you wanted us to help you out. We're helping you out now. I said, well, play something. So I played Canadian capers. He said, now, say something. So I stepped down the podium. It's about a foot high. Walked into the mic and said, hello, everybody. Lopez speaking. And right back to the microphone. I mean, to the band again. He said, is that all you're going to say? What else can I say? I said it again. Well, after that, we played and played and played. And those times, you could play for an hour or two hours. Time meant nothing. In an effort to minimize the government's control over radio, Herbert Hoover had hoped licensed stations would negotiate private agreements for talent and avoid interfering with each other. He soon realized that wouldn't work. On February 27, 1922, he called the first conference of radio telephony to order. Represented at this conference were corporate interests, government agencies, and a few engineers and inventors. Hoover stressed that going forward, the wireless spoken word had one definite field, and that is for broadcasting a predetermined material of public interest. This material must be limited to news, education, and entertainment. Hobbyists interested in using the airwaves to converse with one another and listen to signals from distant places were in direct conflict with the companies that were heavily invested in radio technology and bringing the medium, therefore, to as many people as possible. Hoover saw the way to fix the mess the unregulated airwaves have gotten themselves into was the activation and promotion of large central stations. On September 11, 1922, the General Electric-owned station in Schenectady, New York, began regular musical programs every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday night at a designated time. Eight days later, on September 19th, Westinghouse launched WBZ in Springfield, Massachusetts. WOR took to the air from Bamberger's Department Store in Newark, New Jersey on February 22, 1922. The station cost $20,000 to start. At the time, WOR was the nation's sixth licensed radio station. The transmitter had been assembled at Bamberger's by a salesman in the radio department whose specialty was selling crystal sets. When it failed to work, an experienced radio engineer named W. Nelson Goodwin Jr. was called in to help. Goodwin redesigned and rebuilt the transmitter and got it working in order, enabling WOR to come on the air. Radio legend Jack Popoli was there for the launch. I started with WOR in February 1922, about the time when uh, Bamberger's received the license to broadcast, and this license was issued at that time by the Department of Commerce. We went to Washington in the morning, prepared an application for a wireless telephone license. We submitted it to the clerk. The clerk filled out a, a license, and we came back in the afternoon with a license. We bought an old DeForest transmitter, promptly put it on the air, and on February the 22nd, 1922, was the inauguration date of WOR. And we endeavored to make this February 22, 1922, because the numerals all came out 2 22, 22. But interestingly, the schedule that we prepared at the time, we had a half hour of broadcasting in the morning from 10 to 10.30. We had a half hour of broadcasting in the afternoon from 2 to 2.30. And then we were also on the air between 6 and 7 o'clock. The same month WOR launched, RCA took control of WJZ in Newark, moving its headquarters to New York. On March 2nd, WEAF took to the air in New York. Originally owned by AT&T, in 1926, the station was bought by RCA, giving RCA two flagship stations in New York. WEAF New York. By 1926, WJZ would become the flagship station for NBC's Blue Network. WEAF 
would become the flagship station for NBC's Red Network. Radio is a very important medium. I don't think most people realize the importance of it. From the standpoint of national security, it's absolutely essential. It's the only medium that can reach all the people at a moment's notice, no matter what calamity might befall the country. So it's a necessary medium. At the same time, of course, it takes care of people who uh, either don't like television or who are too busy to be sitting in front of a television set who want to walk around and be entertained or informed. It's becoming more and more of an information medium. Oh, it's really divided almost in two. Either stations that put a great accent on music, practically nothing else for just a few minutes of news every once in a while, and stations that put a great accent on information and discussion. And we chose the latter chorus. Uh, it's a more expensive way of going about it, but it does provide a very important service. And I think it's a product that is indestructible from the standpoint of uh, the kind of demand that there will always be for it. I pride myself in the quality of our news organization. It's certainly by far the best of any organization in broadcasting, and I think it compares favorably with any organization, even in the print media. And uh, therefore, we're better equipped to do an all-news station operation than almost any other network or any other organization. A little over a year later, the man who you just heard, William S. Paley, purchased a fledgling group of networks from the Columbia Phonograph Company, christening it the Columbia Broadcasting System. The network age was upon the ether. I like listening uh, to radio. I used to like to listen, and I think everybody liked to listen to radio because it gave them a chance to see it in their mind's eye. There's a one-inch screen up there that everybody saw Fibber McGee and Molly's closet empty out and heard it to the sound effects, you see. And for instance, in a radio show, a girl in a pair of jeans and a sweatshirt can say to a guy in a sweatshirt and a pair of jeans, can be together and they put a record on of soft music and he can say to her, you're the prettiest girl at this dance. And that only costs nothing. On television, I've been running the thousands of dollars of Japanese lanterns you gotta hang and all that stuff. You know, it makes, they make a big production out of that. I used to be my mother's baby When I was near my dad went wild Whenever we had Next time on Breaking Walls, a web of stations begins to stretch from coast to coast with first one, then two, and finally three major network conglomerates arising. Three cities would emerge as the main hubs for broadcasting, and an entire generation of actors, writers, comedians, and musicians would become national heroes. I'm nobody's baby. Today's introduction music of Metamorphosis No. 2 was arranged for harp and vibraphone by David Peters and played by Miss Elizabeth Hainan. You can pick up her album, Home, Works for Solo Harp, on iTunes, Amazon, and listen on Spotify and Pandora. Her website is elizabethhainan.com, and she is on YouTube at Elizabeth Hainan Harp. The reading material for today's episode was The Rise of Radio, from Marconi Through the Golden Age by Alfred Balk, Inventing American Broadcasting, 1899 to 1922, by Miss Susan J. Douglas. Empire of the Air, by Tom Lewis. A Pictorial History of Radio's First 75 Years, by B. Eric Rhodes. Hello, Everybody. The Dawn of American Radio, by Anthony Rudell. And The Network, by Scott Woolley. I'd like to thank Walden Hughes and John and Larry Gassman, three old-time radio enthusiasts who host their own program through the Yesterday USA Radio Network, which you can visit at yesterdayusa.com. They put me in touch with many Golden Age enthusiasts and given me access to a lot of reading and audio material. They, and I as well, belong to the Old Time Radio Researchers Group, whose comprehensive library of old-time radio shows can be found at otrrlibrary.org. They also have a Facebook group, which you can find by searching for the Old Time Radio Researchers. I'd also like to thank the late Les Tremaine and the late Jack Brown for their wonderful 1986 documentary series, Please Stand By, A History of Radio. 
If you're in New York City, check out the Fireside Mystery Theater. They produce new time audio dramas live at the Slipper Room at 167 Orchard Street on the Lower East Side each month. For more information on their next show, go to firesidemysterytheater.com or check out the Facebook page. And if you're not in New York, fear not. You can subscribe to their podcast, which are the live recordings of the audio dramas enacted each month at the Slipper Room. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, and Audioboom. I subscribe to the podcast. I was listening to the podcast before I ever saw a live show. There is nothing lost by not being there live. And you can find Breaking Walls everywhere you get your podcasts or through thewallbreakers.com. To support this show, please go to patreon.com slash thewallbreakers. There, you can unlock juicy bonus content and material by becoming a patron for the show for as little as $1 per month. I'll be updating with new content for patrons at least once per week going forward. And The Wall Breakers, we're on all social media at The Wall Breakers, and you can reach me at james at thewallbreakers.com. The next episode in our series on the history of the American radio drama will be available on March 15, 2018. This episode will pick up around 1922 and take us through the birth of the major networks in the late 1920s. Until that time, my name is James Scully. This has been Breaking Walls episode number 76, and I'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you very much. <laughs>